This is the SOB Podcast. I'm John Shrek McPhee, the Sheriff of Baghdad. Today we're talking to Greg Thompson about retention shooting. The average concealed carry holder, right? Yeah. Because here's, cause here's why. The average guy is going to be in the gas station when it gets robbed, right? He's not, look, the average guy isn't fucking running because he, he, you know, he's not bugging out because he's got mm-hmm. a fucking family. The average guy, you know what I'm saying? Like the average yeah. guy is a, a fucking, a lawyer, a doctor, a, you know, a construction, whatever, right? And, and um, you know, and this is the premise of this podcast, right? Is, um, you know, what I wanted to talk to you about is retention shooting, right? What you mm-hmm. see on the internet, right? And I'm, I'm doing a video series on it over like a month period, right, for the members. And, you know, I am traditionally against this, mm-hmm. right? But, but let me explain why. You know, the internet says, you know, shooty, stabby, right? You shoot from the hip and like, oh, that's great, right? Like, and, and, and do all that shit you want on the rain, but you're doing it in front of a fucking paper target and you're not doing it in front of someone who wants to fight you. you there's so many factors, right? So yeah, first off, yeah. the range, the rangeness or theatrics of this premise is bullshit, right? But the next thing is the average guy, right, if someone comes up, they're on the street, they're out somewhere, the average guy, this is going to be give me your wallet shit, give me your key shit, give me your, you know, the average guy isn't going up against fucking hardened enemies, Mm -hmm. right? A concealed carry holder in the United States, you pull out the knife, the knife's a deadly weapon, cops will fucking shoot you for that, right? So... This is now assault with a deadly weapon. Okay, if I'm going to do assault with a deadly weapon, whether I'm justified or not, what weapon would I want to use, right? So what I do, you know, what I've been telling guys is if you're going to do the retention shoot where you get the gun out, the gun's next to your hip, and you're like, wow. If you're going to do that, you need to be able to control the other guy to get that really close hit because if he gets too far, A, you're not going to hit, and B, if he gets too far, why don't you just draw and fucking shoot anyway? Right? So yeah. the whole premise of my retention is why is the knife always first? You know what I mean? Because the truth is, is we've talked about this before, and I, well, I don't, I don't know, know what. Yeah, and I don't even worry about, like, and see, for me, I'm not contaminated with some guy with, you know, half a million followers that pulls a knife and then the gun and that, <laughs> and he shows all. I mean, I, I don't know what hey, they do. Hey, and you know he's what I mean? Like, like, hey, he's got you, better you hair. You got than your us reasons. Got like, maybe back. you showed a video and all of a sudden everybody loved it and you got all these likes. So you just kept doing it based on the, the media and the movies. Like, there's a reason why the movies fight the way they do, right? Like, if you watch a choreographed fight scene, there's a reason. Those guys are masters. Like, I would love to be a fight choreographer. That would be bad. But I'm not suited to do that. I, I yeah. started looking into it. I'm like, yeah, I want to be a fight. But you know what? When they started to do this fancy stuff, I want to be like, I want to puke because, but it looks good on TV. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that stuff is, and I like to watch it on TV when it's complete. Like, you know, but it's not really, I could probably pull it off. You know what I mean? But I have to reprogram where I'm at in reality, you know? And then start it in injecting it into it. But that, that's what people do that they start. And, and that's the thing is when you're, um, the one eye man is king in a room full of blind people, right? If you've got one <laughs> eye and everybody's blind, you're a king. You are a freaking king, you know? And one of my, one of my instructors said that one day a long time ago. And I thought that was a good one. So I had to steal it. But, um, that that's so much the case when it comes to knowledge. Like I, I never put my hat down, but there are times you may draw them, you know? I mean, I don't know. We can bring it up on the podcast. If we, if we started yet or whatever, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. 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 No, we already started. We're, like, we, we're already in there. <laughs> it's already, too late. Yeah. It's too, okay. Well, the deal, my deal is here with, um, with uh, everything has its place. So there is a place where you will draw the knife first. This is okay. where I found it. I found it to be. So to be fair is just I like to take everything and put it on the shelf where it belongs because I'm going to say nothing is wrong. If you want to play to the census, though, all right, define, you have to define the problem. And the problem's really broad. Like, where are you at now? 
if you're in a small room or a bus or a plane and you know you can't break contact, it's about you're going to need to close that gap, get to it, and, and engage. But the other problem is, too, you may go to the knife because you don't have a through-and-through through shot. You know what I mean? Like, I want to shoot this guy, but he, I can't because behind his hips are somebody, and I may end up shooting that person, so you go to a knife. But then it won't be, in my mind, it won't be knife, and then, bam, I've just shot this guy. You know what I mean? It's like, because there's going to need to be something to go on. And plus, you know, everybody has a plan. You know what I mean? And they're, And when you put a piece of steel in them, they're going to move. You know what I mean? And if his plan when he saw you reach for it was to arm drag you, or to do something. So for me, at that range, you know, as a cheat is is make sure you win the leverage position. You know, understanding your your ranges, right. your angles, your grips, and your position. Understand those things. Understand those things not just for you and him. Understand it for the environment. The environment is his support elements. Where are they? Where are your support elements? Am I grabbing this guy, spinning him, and right. holding him so you can shoot him? Or you may see us right. fight and you see a gun and you got to shoot him, but then I spun this way and now you shot me. You see, right. am I stacking his threats? I see his buddy coming. I manipulate him so when I'm shooting him or stabbing him that his buddy can't get a good shot on me. So now I clenched him up to stack threats. And now that his support guy didn't even see me draw my weapon and I'm angling it up to go through his abdominal region. So now it's splashed through that guy into the other guy, right? Um, and then you bought yourself some time because when we deal with this for some of our snatches, that's where you're going to see it like we really play it out and we make it almost the game to where you don't want to get snatched. But guess what? We want to practice snatching you anyway. So now we're sparring each other in these scenarios to see what works. And if you play it from the thing that we're snatching the guy, but I don't want to brandish any weapons, but I'm armed. And we look at him. We, I think we can drag this guy around the corner here and then we can do what we need to do. So the first guy that grabs him, he identifies somebody else coming. I can up my use of force, but when I see you just struggling with a guy, I may come over just with my hands and then all of a sudden realize there's gunfire and it went through my buddy and it just hit me and I never even saw the gun until rounds are just blistering me up. You know what I mean? So that can play out. Now, where we work the knife into it quick is if you foul the working hand, the working hand is the hand that makes the motion to the firearm. If you suppress that in any way, you pin it, you hold it, I can't get it out. First thing, though, I need to make sure I don't just go for the knife in a mundane way because I need to make sure I win that scramble because if one hand is in the hip and at the exact same time other hand's going to my waistline and he already had planned to arm drag me or double leg me over some furniture when he saw me even reach for something, then I'm going to be in an advantageous position over that and he may even get to my back. And now I'm trying to stab somebody from behind me. I'm trying to get my gun out and he's still managing it because we will practice that. We'll do a swim and an arm drag. You know, an arm drag is bringing it over, swim is my hand over the top or maybe even a duck under. So we prefer in the engagement to beat the support hand, no matter if it's a knife or whatever, and get to the back, file to file the other hand. And I may just hold a guy so then somebody else can shoot him or then get to my tools to drive him over something. So Without getting off too off, I analyze things from all these angles, right, when I have to right. think about it. But if he goes for the knife without the control, this guy may have already planned on doing an arm drag anyway, and he may, you may miss with the knife. You know what I mean? Now, these things happen in nanoseconds. So it doesn't say you can't stab a guy in the throat and achieve an outside collar tie-up and leave it there. You know what I mean? You're going to have to yeah. maybe leave it there. You're not just going to be the stab and then come back with two hands. If you do that, then you need to add your footwork into it and say, all right, I stabbed him in the throat. I stepped offline, stacked him, and then shot him, but I'm moving at the same time. So that's, that, that can happen. You know, um, if you're a support element, if I come in, I want to shoot this guy that's on your back. You're fight, they're fighting for your gun, but I can't get a good through and through. That happens more often than not that you will pull support. You will not have a good through and through shot based on the environment will not dictate you move into a certain spot in the room or the or or even out in the parking lot, or the uh, the dead space or the uncleared space or the threat is on a certain spot that you can't maneuver around this guy to shoot the bad guy because you're going to expose yourself to other unknown. So you're forced to go to a knife to soften the guy up so then your buddy can then free his hands up to shoot him as well. So those are times where you may go to the knife first. So these are all variables and factors, but when it comes just to the fact 
of your, and a lot of times when I see what you were talking about before about the quick draw, is it a drill? All right, I do drills to where I will punch a bag, top pad, scoop a dagger out, but it won't just be one stab. It'll be a flow of three or four stabs and then transition to the pistol, then the pistol's out. But it started from a progression of punching to knife comes out in, this, in the cycle of punches to the handguns out, and then you move them. But this is only explained as being a drill. It's not like I'm going to punch a guy in the face, and they go, right. now I'm going to stab the guy, and now I'm going to shoot the guy. No, it's a, tra- it's a drill to transition from tool to tool. Um, and with the dagger design that we have, you can maintain a steady shoot platform because the skeletonized handle will allow you to put two hands on the firearm and then if we do um, manipulate people at will. But the other, you know, and also jumping, I know I'm vomiting a bunch of stuff on you, but all these answers are popping in my head and, and verbal. <laughs> you have That's the right. fact, too, that um, if you draw the knife all the time first, um, when you have to handle somebody that's not a, a threat, so then you have the person that thinks you're the bad guy or, you know, it could be grandma running because you just shot Billy Bob or you're going to engage somebody. Somebody will come at you where you may have to move down the less than lethal options, and if all you have is a, a knife in one hand and a handgun in the other, it, there's a chance you might end up stabbing somebody or you know or doing something that's going to not be what you want. You know what I mean? Um, so if you're going to, in my opinion, if you're going to draw the knife first and it's a drill, know it's a drill, but when you're doing it, think about in the environment in which you might would find yourself in and understand the variable. You know what I mean? And, right. you know, you, all we have to do is we have to go by statistics. So we have to study how are these things, how they've really gone down, not necessarily how I, Greg Thompson, perceives it to go down, but statistically how are these things gone down and then recreate it and then, and then amp it up enough until you lose. Like, what will it take for you to lose it? You know, not win that altercation with whatever tools you have. And then you know how to make it better. You know what I mean? It's like if I show a technique and everybody does it perfect every time, they never get challenged. As soon as they get to a a real match, they're going to run into something that's going to mess them up and they won't know where the, where the little glitches are, you know? Um, but you have to run everything through that design process, you know? And for me, coming from a design background, I, I have no emotional attachments to nothing. I don't, you know, I try to attack it two ways. If I see somebody doing something that I'm not fond about, I look at it. Sometimes I attack it first, like, oh, these are the likes why I don't like it. And then I say, okay, now what's good about this move? And I forget about yeah. every negative thought I had on it. And I say, this move, I could make it work here, here, and here. These are the circumstances that would have to unfold, and it fits here on the shelf. And then you find out that that move is only five, should only be 5% of my training time because or is right. it creating scars? Like, you know, they use, they talk about combative scars, and that means that you're doing a technique so much that you're going to try to inject it in something that may be counterintuitive for you later right. under stress. And that's where you may know better now, but in stress, because you've done that move so much, you just keep going for it. You know what I mean? It's like, I'll see, see some matches, like even jujitsu ma- or MMA matches where guys are so conditioned to go for the guillotine that as soon as somebody head drops, they just shove their hand down and start to squeeze. And that guy's a good wrestler. He's used to defending, picks him up, drives him on his head. When he should have said, you know, you need to defend that takedown in time when you're going to go for that neck or you're going to get right. dropped on your head. You know what I mean? Right. But they were conditioned so much both based on the opposition that they faced in their training that it worked for them. They didn't go against guys that picked them up on the head and dropped them on a regular yeah. basis. You know? Well, that's and what that's I see what with the knife guys. Into. That's what I yeah, see with the knife, knife guy. The knife world, I tell you what, I mean, um, my, um, my grandmother used to say this, you know, about people's perception. She would start off with, bless their heart. You know what I mean? Bless <laughs> their heart. You know, they mean well, some of them. They just don't know. You know, your, bless your heart means the person means well and they're conditioned to think about things in a certain way. There's some good knife guys out there, good meaning that, what they're teaching is close to the answer. You know what I mean? Not to say that what I have is never the answer all the time either. You know what I mean? Um, but think, I see it a lot of it um, that's out there. It reminds me of karate and taekwondo. And I, and I say that because my first black belt was in taekwondo. When I was a little kid, I started martial arts when I was like eight years old. Like um, I wanted to do boxing, but my mom drove me to this boxing gym and she 
we started to go in and then she saw some where it was at and the characters that were coming out. She's like, nope, you're not boxing. So then I started doing Taekwondo and I loved all the kicks and all that. But we used to do something called, uh, you know, we did our katas and we did one steps. You know what a one step is? A one I know what step, katas are. A one step, what we would do is you would get in, in a jumbi, which is a basic stance, and you drop back with one hand back, one hand low, and then they would, you, would, you know, somebody would give you a kia and then you would throw up a straight punch. And when you throw that straight punch, you know, you would move out of the way of it and then you would do a series of technique while this hand is extended out. You know what I mean? And I remember being a little kid. I was like eight or nine years old and we would do all these moves. And then I, all I wanted to do was spar. I just wanted to put the helmet on and just have that physical contact because I was just all over the place. And then I remember asking my instructor, like, well, I can't make one step number two work. And he just looked at me like, oh, well, you've got to practice it more. And I'm thinking, well, there's no way that he's not leaving his hand out there. He's throwing a punch. He's putting it back. He's moving. He's throwing this kick. It moves too quick. Like nobody's going to throw something and just leave it out there. You know what I mean? It, it's, right. and, and, and even as I was just scratching my head. So what's happening with the traditional style of some of the edge weapons stuff, people do movements and they present it out there. And you can say, okay, He's presented out there to give you, it's a training aid. It's a training aid to teach you to move around like even a punching bag that's not punching back or something with an extended limb. Okay, because you're working your footwork, you're able to break it down. But don't fool yourself into think that I'm going to do two moves to your one move or I'm going to do two things to your one thing. And that one thing that you're doing is a sewing machine piston of a knife and I'm going to be able to do two things or three things before that hand ever comes back. Or I'm going to catch that hand in in motion. You know what I mean? Like, um, it's really hard to do. So that's where, you know, it, it gets weird. And, and I don't really worry too much about it. You know, I remember when I went to work with the air marshals right after 9-11, I, I floated around and I thought it was cool that they had this high concentration of edge weapon guys float in. And I and I was looking at um at one of these fancy guys, I mean, he had some beautiful technique. And for the martial arts side of it with knives, I thought this guy moved beautifully. And I respected the movements that he did, even though I know it, only a small percentage of it would probably translate if he and I grabbed some training knives and said, freaking kumite it right now. You know what I mean? Um, and I remember looking at and I, and a guy named Pat Tadina. He's a Ranger Hall of Fame. He served with Dick Davis. You know Dick, right? Mm -hmm. And um, he. Um, and Pat Tadena, you can look him up, Ranger Holly, little bitty uh, Hawaiian, Filipino descent, about 130 pounds. He was about 60 years old, and he had hundreds of confirmed kills in Vietnam with a knife. He was doing crazy stuff in Vietnam, and some of the stories I heard from the guys, he wouldn't even talk about. The other guys would talk about how the stuff that he pulled off was like epic movie type kind of stuff, you know what I mean? But anyway... He had real world experience with a knife, but no formal training. And, and, um, I was sitting next to him on these mats watching this guy and I could tell by his body language that he was just getting really upset. Like he wouldn't look at the guy doing these moves, you know. And I was yeah. like, you know, Pat, what do you think? What do you think? You know, and he's like, he looked at me and he looked down. He didn't say anything. And I said it because he's a really soft spoken guy. And, uh, he looked over at me and he goes, he needs to put the fucking still in. I'm like, and I'm like, whoa, all right, what's up? He's a little upset with this, you know, and he just turned his head and it was spent too much time doing fancy stuff. And he was like, look, you need to just put the metal in him and, and, and quit teaching these guys to perceive it that way. You know what I mean? Just put the freaking steel in him and get done with it. And when you start to train with enough really high end guys that can do all that stuff and they've been around forever and you really have to say, hey, look. I'm bringing you in. Like, I, I brought Dan and Asanto in. I brought guys from Sayat Kali, and I brought guys decades ago from everywhere. And when you really sit down with some of these guys, like, well, if it's really life or death, this is what you're going to do. There's no fluff. It's back to the freaking, like, you know, just hit the targets. You, it's all about what are you hitting, switches and valves and targets. What are you targeting? What are you trying to get? Footwork and movement and, and maybe stuffing and managing their, their limb while you're trying to hit your target and get back out. So. People spend more time doing the drills as opposed to the actual fight. You know, for us, we don't have time to do that. I don't have time enough to do a lot of just 90% drills. I've got to go straight to 90% scenarios, 10% drills, right? Um, but people like doing the drills and it looks cool. So you'll see flow drills, you know, uh, and the flow drills are good. I mean, it does help some of it, but how much of it translates? 
when I give you a training knife and I got to train a knife and we go, we're going to fight, right? And we're not, not just going to fight out in the open. Now I'm going to put cubes around you where you can't move. I'm going to throw you in a 10 by 10 room full of cubes. And you start to fight when you feel the steel hit. Why? Because 80% and I've done that. I've got over, I've got close to 300 now knife assaults. I've done my statistics and other people have done statistics too. And, and we're right around the same thing on this. 80% of our knife assaults, you will not even see the knife. You won't see it. Like you can have, you know, read body language real well. You know, you can understand people's, you know, a nonverbal communications. You can understand all kind of stuff. But if somebody wants to put a piece of steel in you, they're going to do it. Like even with my training or your training, they're not going to throw a knife in front of us and go, Greg, I'm going to stab you with this knife. You know, you're going to wait till I'm over there, you know, eating a sandwich, fixing my hair, shooting the shit, tying my shoes, and you're going to come over there and you're going to freaking shank me. Why? Because you were serious about doing it because you know that if you just pull it and start talking about it, I'm probably going to transition, break contact, stack something, shield something, pull my tools out while I'm shielding, and then now it's, it's going to be on. You know what I mean? Or somebody else is going to intervene. Which, you know, that's another percentage of it. You know, there's, there's a good percentage where people intervene verbally or, or angling and stuff that you have to address. So un- understand that, you know, when it comes to, to the knife stuff, but talking about, you know, using a knife, people just, just do this. Practice your technique, get a training knife. If you don't even have a training knife, get an empty water bottle, right? And, and hold it reverse. And, and start freaking fighting each other. But don't do this. Don't fight and go, oh, you touched me. I'm dead. No, you won't die quick enough. Like you'll hit, you'll hit the major arteries, right? But you can look in the statistics in my H2H book that I printed and it's in all my manuals. There's stats. The quickest bleed out you're going to have, you're going to be there for a good 15 seconds. I got videos where guys have been stabbed in the heart with the blade flat. So it slipped right through the rib cage and the dude jumped up, ran, looked around. 15 seconds later, he falls out dead. But 5, 10 seconds, how many people can you shoot even in 5 seconds? How many people could you draw yeah. your gun <clears throat> and engage in 5 seconds? See, yeah. So when you start talking about that, how many people could you stab when he stabs you? So however you move in to stab somebody, he's got a plan going too, and you're going to have to manage his support hand. And So all these variables have to come into play. So when we do the knife on knife, it's not, he stabbed me. It's who gets stabbed the least amount of times. So now we're fighting, and uh, maybe you have a knife or have a training knife, and I don't, or maybe we both. But we judge it by who got stabbed the least is the winner. You know what I mean? And that's the way a knife right. fight is. It's right. about it's about hey, least amount of of blood and protect your vital area. So if I give somebody advice, obviously would be you know your situational awareness, nonverbal communications, but protect your vital areas because. When you do get stabbed in that lethal spot, you're, you're, you know, you're not a vampire and it's not a wood stake. You're going to be there for a little bit. And you don't know if the first stab is going to kill you or the hundredth stab. So protect your vital areas, manage that piston. So the techniques that we end up showing, I show right away are mainly at what's called medium range, meaning I'm at the clinching range. Why? Because I know 80% of the time I'm so, I'm teaching you for real to survive that he's going to close on you. And you're not going to be the backup fast enough, and you're going to have to stuff and manage that piston before you can transition to something else and manage the holes that are going on there. Get to position to, to stifle that piston if you can. If you have room enough, pick up something, stack stuff, break contact, get your tools out, and practice moving and processing the environment tactically to create the space. You know, and you die. You know, that's a, that's an, another person's thing die less often that's a mark denny saying that i like and i say bleed less often you know you're not going to bleed quite as much um when you do that you know and um but you just have to do it and and the problem is people do all these drills and and they don't do the task there's no better training than the task itself if you want to be a good swimmer right we can go and, and and do kicks on the side of the pool i can you can put your face in the water and move your arms you can lay out on the land and and move but at some point you've got to venture into the deep end and just do it you know what i mean right. and um and and just dog pack you know what i mean you may not even be able to do freestyle but check this out if you really want to survive learn how to even dog paddle to the side before you start trying to do freestyle butterfly 
day day one on the sidelines and never jump in the water because then you're going to fall in the water, try to do freestyle or butterfly stroke, and you're going to drown getting to the side. You know what I mean? Yeah. Learn how to dog paddle. Learn a first grade, like this is the way shit goes down. Accept it for what it is. Um, and I show techniques and I say, hey, you know what? If I'm fighting my equal, you know, replicate myself, my equal or greater, and you give me a knife and I'm fighting myself, who do you think is going to win? You know? Me with a knife is going to be me without a knife. Reality is just that way. You know what I mean? Right. So all you're really giving people in these survival situations is a tactic that may help them survive depending on the intent of the individual. A lot of these knife assaults too, and even growing up around people that have used knives um, against us, and I had buddies to stab people, and I'd cuss them out and get mad, but sometimes they would just cut a guy to be like, hey, I want to teach him a lesson. It wasn't even a stab like I'm going to kill you. It's like you're running your mouth and you, you piss me off, so I'm just going to slice you across your stomach one time or poke you one time and make you run away Think about it. But yeah. they really didn't initiate the knife assault with the intent of, I'm going ape crazy shit and I want to kill you. It's, it's more of a threat or a lesson they're trying to teach somebody. And even guys overseas have been cut. They've been walking through crowds and guys would just slice them in the back because they didn't like them and they didn't even know who cut you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because yeah, they didn't yeah. like your language, your clothes. They figured you from somewhere else. And um, they're just, you know, seeing how you were going to react, you know. Uh, to a certain situation. So these are our variables to, to look at with, with the knife and what are people's intent and how you're going to deal with it. But it gets clouded with so much information. You know, the average person just goes and starts Googling really cool techniques. And, you know, I've even had students go, well, I don't like that technique, Greg, because there's a chance I'm going to get cut. So, and I'm like, okay, well, show me what you like to do. And then if they show something crazy, I'm like, okay, well, in a little bit, do this move now, but in a little bit, I'm going to line you up against the wall. I'm going to do this with my guys a lot. And I'll take, um, I'll take the cubes and I'll lay them all over the mat, right? All the cubes or the obstacles everywhere. And I take three guys. They face the wall. And the other guys have these foam knives. They're called nook knives. And you can really hit people really hard with them. And I said, when you feel yourself getting stabbed, turn around. And survive until I say stop or make it to the other end of the mat. You can either run or you can either fight, and it's up to you. But I, it is canned in the sense that I say no strikes to the face because there is some technique to headbutts because I'm big on tying up the, the two-on-one and smashing in, leading with the head control because I want head control in the clinch to gain leverage over that limb. So I'll always lead with a headbutt to dominate the clinch. So I, I leave that out of it. So it's a little can, but hey, when you turn around, Show me what you can do. I want to see, because if you can pull off some fancy, cool stuff, I'll be the first one to walk over there and say, I like that move. And I, he probably won't show one that I hadn't spent a little time with because I've been down the rabbit hole of cool techniques. And <laughs> even when I see something that I think we is all like have. 99% we all have. bullshit, I still want to do it because I'm just a martial artist. I want to play with it and see what made that work. And then, okay. And then you try to give the move a benefit of the doubt, just like jujitsu, because even being a black belt for 16 years, I still look at a move and then hoist or somebody will come and add that 5% that made that move a little bit better. You know, and so many guys, even with me over the years, they see a move, they're only doing the move 80% right. And, and you, but you see them, but you can't see that they're only doing 80% right because you're not feeling them do the move on you. And you move on to another technique. And then later, they're not committed to the move because they never got it right. And you try to explain, hey, why didn't you do this technique? Oh, it doesn't work for them. Well, do it on me. Let me feel you do it. No, no, no. You left this out. Your grip was slightly off here. You fix them. And then they're like, oh. And then now they're hitting the move, you know? Mm. But they didn't know. It's just like yeah. when you're watching all the stuff and the videos. And that's what's nice about the way you break things down is you have to break it down that way. Like even the human eye can't pick up all the details that are there. Can't, and and can't. teaching shooting is a lot different than Jiu-jitsu, because jiu-jitsu, you have to feel the person. There, you can physically see, like, stance, posture, you know, trigger pull, where he's looking at, all these little things to give it to him. And you can kind of do that with striking a little bit. You know, you can, you can see a guy with his, his boxing um, and, his, and what I call MMA striking, because MMA striking has the foundation of boxing, but it's different. You know what I mean? It's different. Mm -hmm. And you have to move and do stuff slightly different. Um, but I like the foundation of, of boxing linking to it. But you have to study all that stuff, man. And, and that's where the, the you know, pe 
knife stuff and we, we ask like the knife world, it's like religion. You know what I mean? If you start saying something that somebody doesn't like, it, it, it they just get all upset. You know what I mean? Right, um, right. There's well, that's a lot like, of great knives guys is... out there and a lot of them end up showing some fancy stuff because they know their students like it. So they lead and spend a lot of time on the drills. But when you really pull them aside and go, hey, man, check this out. You're having to fight for your life. You've got 30 minutes to train this guy, and they're getting ready to fight. And your guy's got to win this match right here, or he's dead, or he's, he's you know, your system doesn't work. What are you going to show them? Because they're going to fight. Two guys are going to fight each other knife on knife or ambush each other, right. taking turns. And whatever you give your guy, if he can't pull off, your, your, your stuff's not being taught. And you'll see some guys really start to reevaluate what they do because there's no fluff there. You know what I mean? They're not trying to build Instagram followers or whatever it is that they want to do. Or, and, but right. some of them don't know it. And that some of their, their student students that end up teaching people, they 100% believe in what their guy's doing and they practice enough they can make it work. But when you take the athletic guys that I have to deal with that are shit smart and that will look at you and go, I don't think that'll work, you know, you're going to have to put up or shut up. You can't go, oh, let me talk my way out of it. You know, that's not going to fly. You know what I mean? They want force on force. It's, it's everything finishes with reality, you know? Um, so being on this subject for 20 years and, you know, I've got my knives out. I've got the, the sock P dagger and I've got a folder that's out now. And, um, you know, I'm, and even talking about folders and fixed blades, you know, there's, that's a whole nother avenue there too, you know, with the, with the folders, you know, it's better to have a thick blade, right? Fixed blade's better. You know, it's faster, easy to get it out. Um, and, and, you know, that's what the dagger is for is I can pin my hand, a, a weapon system down, go to the dagger, create space, and the skeletonized hand allows me to hold it and transition between force multipliers, move up and down lethality a little bit better. But it is nicer to have a bigger knife, you know what I mean? Like we talked about before, like, hey, if I'm going to, duel somebody with an edge weapon i mean if i have the space i mean i want a samurai sword i want the I, that's why swords are made i'm not going to come out with my sock p three and a half inch blade and start trying to duel somebody with a knife but if you've got to carry it all the time with all your other shit and you're running around with a freaking rambo knife that, that gets hung on your sling and somebody else can grab like the old the kydex sheath too when we were even at the beginning of the of the war some guys would carry bigger knives, you know, with the Kydex sheath that had no real retention. So we'd start doing scenarios. Somebody could grab it and use it against them or it gets hung on their sling or hung on stuff. So really, the guys that were really doing a lot of softer stuff, believe it or not, a lot of them just had Leathermans and folders in their pockets. You know what I mean? That's what I carried. They they were like, oh, this, I'm for the mission that they were on. They're not surviving off the land, you know? And then if you even look at the knives, like look at the, the knives that came out and, like the Rambo knife. Well, when we did more jungle warfare stuff, they were using that knife to survive off the land and fight with. But if you go back to World War One and World War Two, when they were fighting in the trenches and stuff, what kind of knife was that? That was a dagger. Why? Because you got to go through dagger. clothes. Yeah, you've got to go through clothing. You got to stab through clothing. It's hard to slice through clothing. It's hard to finish somebody really quick with slices. Now, you can, and there's guys that are really good at it, but I'd lead with a stab and, and rotate the blade and slash on the way out. Or the main principles of the sock P dagger is touch the tonsils, stir the pot. If I'm escaping the mount, I'm bringing out, you probably didn't even see it, I'm lodging it in the hip femoral or, or the, um, the liver, the spleen, or I might even you know go into the perineum if it presents itself. I'm going to grind that thing. I'm going to better my position with my legs and I may finish you with a knife or as soon as I get the opportunity, the handgun's coming out when I'm in a leveraged position to deploy it because the handgun is easier to foul. And if they grab the barrel, they can pick where the round's going. I may can pick where it, when it goes off and I don't want that slide to get jammed. So I prefer to be in a leveraged position, but there's sometimes like, Hey, if you, his buddy's coming with an AK around the corner with a, a machete and you're on the ground with this guy. And he's in a leverage position. You may have to roll the bones and say, hey, I'm going to pull my pistol out. I'm going to shoot from what we call the V grip. I'm bringing it up, pinning it close to my body, rotating up. He might be mounted on me. I'm going to fire it right there and do a, maybe even a self-induced malfunction to clear your hand off of it. Pop one in the hip, start shrimping, right, mixing your jujitsu with the firearm, tap right, clear it again, and then start engaging whatever's there. 
because it, it will work. Now it's risky, but the environment will dictate what risk you take. And your understanding of if I just pull this gun out when I don't need to, is he going to pin it? He's athletic enough to be in a leverage position on you anyway. So if you just fall over something, your shitty leverage position, you got to pull it out, you might get it taken from you. And that's when you pin it. You always have an edge weapon you can deploy with your support hand and know where you're going to stick, right? Like, like your punch back. Perfect. Support hand, either hand draw, pin that gun, punch him in the throat with that punch dagger, start twisting it. You know, and that's a great lever to open up the wound cavity, right? That's why I stir the pot with the dagger. Um, and if you do stab, I like to leave it in, especially when you're in a leverage position in the clinch. If you're in a leverage disadvantage position and you're mounted or side mount me, I stab you and pull it out, or I slice you and move to another spot. It gives you the opportunity to grab it and pin it and stab me with it or take it away or stall out. And then I got to wait for you to bleed out from that what potentially may have been a bleed out stab that I got before you grabbed it. But if I plunge it into you, stir the pot, right, or turn it like like the like you would do with the punch dagger, he moves, I better my position, knees coming into play or getting to my feet, breaking contact, whatever it might be, better your position and then transition to it. You're going to be able to engage more threats around you quick, right? So that was the, the reason for the dagger. And even with the, what people don't know with the progression of the dagger was when I designed the SOC P dagger, I really, um, it came from, opera, I would tell opera, I didn't care about designing a knife. It didn't matter to me when we first got back. It was like, hey, bring a knife, whatever trainer you have, you know, get a trainer. If you don't have a trainer, dull it, paint it blue or red, let them know it's a trainer, and we'll take it in the class. And I remember guys getting tackled in kit, and they, they were in bad position. I'm like, pull your knife, grind, and bring your knees in, transition to your uh, handgun to start engage, finish with the handgun. Use the steel to get to the lead because it's not about you and him. Don't pull your knife. And, and try to finish the guy with the knife because you're not going to be able to deal with his buddy quick enough. You use the knife to create space to, en to engage other potential threats if for that environment. But when guys would get tackled, I remember this operator, really, really good, great question. Questions that get glazed over when people do the full scenario. He pulls a knife, he stabs the guy, he's transitioned to his handgun, and, and he's looking, he goes, Greg, what do I do with the knife? Do I leave it in them? Do I throw it on the ground? Do I re resheath it? In the middle of an altercation like that, you can't afford to take time to resheath it and lose arm positioning potentially because somebody else may get on you. You have to deal with that threats that are around you as fast as possible. I'm like, that's a problem. And I like problems. Why? Because I come from a design background. I gravitate to it because this is just what I like to do. Other people glaze by that, you know. So then the progression of the knife is I don't need a big knife. I want it to slide behind the molly, fit behind everything. When nobody sees it, it scoops out. You're creating space. If you need a bigger knife, get a bigger knife. Now, um, but I actually started what was called a rail tool. I designed a knife that fit onto the rail system of the gun, and it would pop off, and you could clear them out. You could do all kind of stuff with it, stab people. It was badass. I, had, I paid like a grand <laughs> to get a 3D model made of it, right? I had a 3D model. had a professional and I, I ran it through the whole design process like asking guys and everybody was like oh yeah that's cool that's cool so I had guys that were really use it they were telling me it was cool right and then when I made the prototype everybody's like yeah that's cool and then I'm like oh, okay so let me ask these questions um what what would you pay for it you know and um would what rifles would you put it on and then they, then you saw this look like oh, I'd probably pay this but I wouldn't put that on my rifle I'm like what why not you said it's cool yeah it's cool but I got all my other shit on there I'm not putting that on there. It's not a trade-off to put that rail tool and give up some of the other features that were there. And then I started realizing it too. It was one of those things that were good in theory, but once a guy gets blasted and realizes we tackle each other over furniture, your hand leaves this spot, and now you're having to go back to the rifle to deploy it because it went down too quick. You know what I mean? Like if you knew you were going to do it, you could hit a button and it's out. But you didn't know you were going to do it. He's already hit you. You're behind no. the curveball, right? Well, yeah, but the, the rifle's, the, yeah, the, rifle's the first thing grabbed. You come in with a rifle, dude's grabbing the rifle. Yeah, and so you've got you've to work through that. And we would blast each other over stuff. Guys are having to let go of their guns to manage them getting knocked over stuff. 
and even in the clinch. So then it became, wait a minute, let's move it back to the body. So when I went back to the body, I redesigned the perception of the sheath and redesigned it from a whole different point to where now, and when I, when I finished it, everybody was like, what is that, a throwing star? Like, Greg, we're not, we're not a throwing knife. What is that, a throwing knife? Are we going to wear throwing knives on our – because nobody was really running around with ring daggers, right? If you saw a ring on something, it was a large karam, and it probably wasn't even a skeletonized handle, and it was bulk, and guys, like, that gets hung on everything. Like, I'm not putting that on my kit. I mean, I might as well carry it. And then if you're carrying it concealed, a, a, a fixed karam, but you might as well have a handgun. You might as well have a little 380, you know what I mean, or something, another gun, you know, than, than that. And it's not so that those were the things that I was being hit with. But making it lay so low and fit behind stuff, it just made it easier. The skeletonized handle, when I stab it, I'll plunge the whole handle in there, corkscrew it out, bring it back again. There's so many things. And then it linked to um, our improvised weapons. So we teach a template with the dagger that's real. A lot of arm drags, a lot of moving and using it to break contact and attack the throat. But that works when we do improvised weapons if you sharpen a stick or a piece of metal on concrete and it's just a little rod about six inches long you or a screwdriver you know or scissors or anything you pick up you're going to fight with that it's kind of the same way you know yeah so that template there's a direct transfer into the movements that the guys end up implementing uh with that now with that said you do need a bigger knife you know and then i had guys that are going into meetings and going in places say hey i need a bigger knife and we start exploring a lot of the fixed blade options. You know what I mean? But the problem is with the fixed blades, how many people, everybody says, yeah, you need a fixed blade. It's faster. It's this. Okay. Are you carrying a fixed blade every day? Now there are guys that do, you know what I mean? They'll carry it every day, but it, it can be very uncomfortable and it prints and print really bad. If you're not careful, like all of a sudden everybody knows that you're hard to hide, hard to hide. So what I ended up doing with the folder was I did a, it's a four and a half inch blade. Um, D2 steel cuts other metals, has a, has a glass breaker on the tip of it, but it's really, really thin. It's the thinnest, lightest weight, four and a half inch blade you're going to have. And the clip, instead of having a normal length clip, because what happens when you do an appendix carry and you're hiding it, right? The clip shows underneath the belt, right? With this, the, sh the clip is really short. So when you tuck it in and you're going to church and you, blouse it over the front of it over just enough to cover up to your belt you will never even see it now when you're going into a meeting that's a kind of a hey meeting that you, you know you you may get they may wand you you know what, what's the typical thing move your belt buckle over where the knife is they wand you do you know that in these relaxed places they're not going to tell you to take your belt off they're like oh it's my belt okay i don't see it. they're really looking for firearms you know what i mean but Guys would say, hey, Greg, I got to go into these meetings and there's crazy people in there. I, I want to have it, something larger with me, too, because this is going to be my primary weapon. So we started working with it with, with it like that. But the, this thing is so thin that that when I hold it in my hand, it's a good fist load, you know, and I prefer. And this is something I learned even with the air marshals. Like when I design this, I want it. I want the clip at the hinge point for a longer knife. And, and this is the reason why. You know, I never thought about it till I was working with some students with the air marshals and they had the indoor and the Delica Spider Co. and it could be attached to uh, four spots, real thin, and we fought with those for a long time. When the students said, Greg, where should I put the clip? And I'm like, I don't know. That's, you know what, that's, and I knew from watching people deploy the knife under stress that the clips were in different spots and there were different problems there. So I said, hey, let me think about it. So what I did was I, I laid it all out and started putting each way on the shelf where I thought it belonged. And what I found was this, that if you have to do a support hand draw, support hand meaning you're drawing it with, the, with your weaker hand, right, the hand that you normally don't deploy with, if you grab it and pull it out, you then have to fumble with the knife to get to the point where you can unfold it if it's a folder. But if the, if the clip is at the hinge point, you can pull it up and rotate it equally, deploying it the same with either hand without less movements. So then it becomes the clip at the hinge point has some advantages um, for draw, deploying it with your support hand. And the reason I say that is your, your working hand could be injured. You could be pinning his weapon system down and wedging it over a, a couch or furniture or something. 
and you're pulling out your edge weapon with your support hand. And that happens all the time when you really create these scenarios. So I designed it to be able to preferably go that way. But actually, you can, you can hook it in all four spots. Um, but I prefer to teach it that way. It also comes with two clips, the traditional long clip and then the shorter clip that I'm talking about. It has a call by tip for breaking glass, but you can hammer fist with it without deploying it and punch with it so you have a support of your bone structure of your hand so you can move up and down lethality. But I work that into the system that we have right now. Um, that's primarily done in more of the low-vis courses. The uh, SOT P basic course, we talk about it real briefly, but that's primarily the dagger because, you know, you can get to it. But if a guy is going to carry a bigger knife, this is my thing. If you're going to carry a bigger knife, then you, need, then you probably can carry a handgun. And then you're going to need a smaller edge weapon, fixed blade, that you can get to quickly with either hand or a punch dagger like yours, right, to be able to get to. If you're carrying a firearm and you're preparing yourself for combatives, you need an edge weapon that you can quickly deploy with your support hand without a doubt. If not, um, my guys will take your stuff from you. You will lose your stuff against somebody with a good understanding. Why? Because it's called use of force. There's a point to where if we want to take a guy's gun and I see your printing, I'm not going to be that much of a threat. I'm going to be more, more compliant, more submissive to allow myself to get close enough to you. And then it's, then it's going to be on. You know what I mean? And people blade their body. They ever blade on these scrambles. So if they ever blade, I'm on the back. If they don't ever blade, then I'm on the strong side. And if they don't grapple and fight in the clinch, they're not going to move <laughs> instinctively. And that's where they need to learn basic stuff. Here, pin your weapon system, get to an edge weapon, because it's harder for a grappler or, or, or a fighter to control both sides of the body. I'm either going to isolate your handgun from coming out, or I'm going to isolate this side. Your head will decide what's better leverage inside the clinch, right? Your head always needs to be, be between center line and the dominant weapon. So the only way I can fight for both of these weapons simultaneously is preferably to be behind you, right? I have a better chance of fouling both draws from behind, but then it becomes more of a stall out, you know what I mean? Um, but then in that case, we're utilizing furniture and other obstacles to put you in a leverage position, and then we decide what tool is better to go for. We go for our concealed tool at that time. But that's from this comes from a decade of from working with the air marshals to fight even when they land in another country. You know, not to be bought up before the plane even takes off to decades of work when guys meeting gone bad and just not getting snatched up in another country. So there's certain things that, that you learn and you don't have time enough to bullshit. You know what I mean? Like people die. Like this is not a game. And then, you know, you get watching these people on YouTube showing all kind of cool stuff that's more fear management than actual practicality, you know, um, and that's fine, you know. I, I don't teach civilians for that, that reason. Like, I don't have time to educate people and to take the guy that went, been through some fancy bull crap and explain it to them. You know what I mean? And half the time, they don't really want to fight anyway. They just want to talk about their, uh, perceptions, but they don't want to get on the mat and freaking fight. And whatever you're going to be good at, you've got to lose at it a bunch of times and accept the fact that you're going to get your ass kicked. Because if you can't accept the fact that you're going to get your ass kicked, you'll never get any better. You're living in a bubble. And hopefully nobody busts that bubble. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but that, that's reality. I don't have all the answers. Nobody does. But I know when people just talk about things in theory and don't pressure test it, they're, they're falling behind. It's, it's like traditional martial arts, you know, 20 years ago, which there, there was traditional martial art gyms that they fought. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not, but there's, where everything's a theory, you know, and your best training aid is that, that white belt that comes in that doesn't know that he's supposed to act a certain way. And he's an athletic stud and he just wants to beat your ass. Like, okay, yeah. we can, let's train because I got to get, I got to develop my timing for that guy that's going to be, do the wrong thing, but so quick and unpredictable and he's fast enough. He may make it work. You know, that's where right. you see like even boxers, you know, boxers get really good at striking, but when they start, Boxing other boxers, they do really well. But sometimes they'll get a guy that just wants to trade and just fight. And they're just going to tuck their chin and swing for the fences. You know what I mean? And they can catch them. They can catch the better striker because they don't care. Nobody's told them to do anything any different. And that guy spent a decade 
training people to move the right way. And then now you get a guy that moves the wrong way. But then you have to ask yourself, is that the wrong way? It wasn't the wrong way for him. He still hit you on your jaw and rung well, the bell. So when it you start works, doing right? emphasis on people, you got to study what is really going on. Well, it's back to 80% of us is a freaking muggy. 70% is it going to be a, actually, it, people don't start with a strong hand lead. They actually will, if they do start with a strong hand lead with a knife assault, they quickly go to a support hand lead. Why? Because it's like, I use the example of this. When Rambo's going to kill a wild boar, right, with his Rambo knife, will Rambo jump out of the tree with two hands on the knife pointed straight at the wild boar, or will he jump out with the other hand out wide, right, and grabbing the boar? Why? Because he knows as soon as he pokes that wild boar, it's gone. Same thing with people. As soon as that person gets poked, he, that adrenaline shoots through their body. They are all over the place running. You're going to have to manage distance. And that's where you'll see unexperienced people do the assault, do the initial thing with the support hand in front. So this is a, And that makes it another harder variable when you're doing edge weapon defenses. When you're getting mugged, is dealing with the support hand that can manage the distance. So your defense has to have some managing and not and dealing with the support hand grab just almost as much or close to is the knot, you know what I mean? Because you may block the first stab and then he grabs you and then now you're in, in a leverage disadvantage, you get pushed to move around and the piston's gonna eat you up, you know what I mean? So you have to manage that, you know, understand um, clothing too. You got 60% of the videos that I have, people had long sleeves on, but that could be can, you know, some of the, the, the countries that may not have cameras up or cell phones out, maybe poor, warmer climates so you don't see as many long sleeves but when I, I was surprised when I saw it I thought it would be more 50 50 but so being able to control that arm by the sleeve for a second you know what I mean can really work out pretty well in some of the training that we're doing you know um, know that it that a lot of times 50% of the fight pe people end up tripping and falling over stuff so 50% of the time you may fall why because he stabbed you didn't know it you went to back up and you tripped over something because your only thought was creating space. You didn't train with the proper footwork that you need in fighting. Um, and does your footwork work, work with environment? You know, when we start reworking footwork for the SOC P and we back up, we don't back up like I train my MMA fighters, right? Because they're in an open area. We, we back up with the weight on the lead foot. The back foot's a pro. Now, if you have to move dynamically, you can't always move that way, but it's an understanding of weight shift upon moving backwards to make it less likely for you to trip and breaking angles and stacking stuff. That's a whole nother lecture in itself. So understand how to back up. You know, 10% um, of the time, there's more than one bad guy. 10% of the time. So that's what we saw in these canned videos. Um, but that's for, and these are taking civilian assaults. This isn't talking about, you get snatched, or you're in the military. That's you. You have to know that majority of the time they're going to have multiple, multiple uh, people there. Um, and then um, the uh, what was the other one? The um, the the, the um, pre how long do fights? How long does assault usually last? This is another statistic that kind of shocked me a little bit. And it, the this was fifty percent of the time the knife assault lasted. 15 seconds because it was a mugging. It was 15 seconds, which can be a long time. And then mm -hmm. if it moved into 70%, it was 25 seconds. 80% went to 35 seconds. But check this out. If a knife assault lasted more than 35 seconds, this, they more than likely were going to be there for more than a minute or longer, which means if they stay on you for 35 seconds trying to attack you with this knife, that means that they are committed and they don't care about anybody else around them knowing that they're mugging you, you see. And that may be the environment, meaning that you're in a back room somewhere, you're in an office, you're somewhere to where other people aren't there and they know they're not coming and they're not that much of a hurry. So the environment will dictate the actual length of the actual en encounter as well. 6% um, of the time people switched hands. Um, if 70% of the time it was a forward grip um, because it was a mugging in the forward, lower, lower level forward grip. Injuries that you sustain, most of the time people were right-handed, so it was, on the, it was actually um, on the right side or the, the left side of your body, you know, abdominal, abdominal face, neck, 
you know, ribs on that one side. So more stabs are going to occur on that side. Um, and so you really have to manage thinking about protecting your vital areas, you know, on the cuts and the stabs and create space, you know, the clothing and the clothes you have on the environment's another factor, you know, am I wearing flip flops, you know, am I in a gravel parking lot? Am I in a small room? You know what I mean? Um, am I in a car, you know, did he get bugged me in a vehicle and I'm seated, you know, all these things are factors in your technique. So when I teach a technique, does it adapt to you being seated next to somebody in a vehicle and, and the knife comes out? Are you seated? You know, um, are you on a bus or a plane? You know, so when I do some of the arm tie ups that I do, I prefer to move to an, like an outside tie up. Uh, if I can, sometimes you end up in an over and under hook type deal, but I'm always managing and trying to get to the back of the elbow. And, and, and manage the piston a little bit. The wrist and the hand is often too hard to grab. Um, it's just like punches. If I'm going to clench a guy up to defend punches, I'm not, it's going to be hard to grab the glove, you know what I mean, when it's coming at me and moving. But I manage it by cupping the back of the elbow and try to mitigate, you know, what's going on. And, and it works a little bit better for, for my guys in the period of time that I'm doing it. Other people have other techniques, you know, sometimes it's however you trap that arm. Is it a, a wrap? bring it into an underhook or, you know, the environment would dictate too. There's a lot of techniques can work really good, but once we put them in a room full of furniture or on a bus or a plane, um, the technique, you're not able to do it very well, you know, um, because the person may start with a support hand lead and you're having to now move past the center line of their head for leverage. They, so when you do go to clinch, their head's between your center line and the weapon or they create a frame when you do grab. So whenever you do isolate that, you can't have your head up. You have to win head control to block the outside collar tie up so they don't strip that arm away and then replunge you again. So these are all techniques that we end up teaching. But I know I'm talking too much um, about <laughs> this stuff, and uh, you need to divert it because I, I will go on and on forever. No, no. Okay. <laughs> so I, I really got a couple questions, right? So we'll kind of close out. I'll ask you three kind of questions. And, and I would say this is like, look, the guys I've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan that were shot or, you know, had a hole in the middle of their chest or something. I've seen those guys fight for longer than 15 seconds. I'm going to tell oh, yeah. you that right now. And I tell guys all the time, you can, you can, you can blow out someone's heart. And how do they die? Like drowning. The brain has to run out of oxygen until the brain dies. <laughs> They are still in the fight no matter what's wrong with their body. So, and then, you know, what I've also seen in Iraq and Afghanistan is when someone knows they're going to die, they want to take you with them, right? Like this mm -hmm. fight just increased tenfold and they're not leaving here till you go with them, especially if they know they're going to die. If right? they have and this those, is, that mindset, you know what I mean? And it's most the nervous guys system. do. You've got to shut down the nervous system. If not, it's right. going to take time. And that's why I like right. to. When, when we started messing with all this, and you're exactly right, the feedback and, you know, the stories that I've heard, and, I, and I'm so blessed to be able to get feedback about some people get shot and freaking done. They're like shut down right away. Some oh. people, the amount of holes that get put in, they're like, I can't believe this guy kept coming. Even guys coming back, it was like, this is this, you know. But what happened is it didn't hit some central nervous system, and right. that person's mindset was to keep going. He had the mindset right. to push through it to where he's, if you just hit him once and leave him there, he's going to drop in like 10 seconds. But these things happen so quick from the feedback. And so what I've learned to attack with an edge weapon is it's always the heart and the lung, depending on what you're trying to do is, is I want to, I want to touch the tonsils. I want to affect the breathing of that windpipe because when you plunge a hole into somebody's windpipe, and they can't breathe. It doesn't mean that they're going to die right away. It's not how fast you can kill them. It's how fast you can get them out of your fight, right? Right. And right. so when you plunge that into that windpipe, it's like you're drowning right now. It's I cannot get that oxygen. And you can be on drugs. You can be enraged. But now things, you just change their channel. You know what I mean? Instinctively. But you can hit the heart. You can hit some stuff. And they're going to die but they may not die fast enough to pull a grenade or fast enough right. to hold you until their buddy comes and hacks you with a machete while you're trying to get your piece out. Um, 
So it became, hey, we're going to hit these spots, and I'm never going to assume that you're going to die either. Nothing I do. I'm not, you know, people go, oh, you can kick him in the nuts and poke him in the eye, and he's going to fall over. Like, no, I've kicked people in the nuts, and I've poked him in the eye. Some may fall over, some don't. You never stop moving. You let all that right. be a caveat until they're done. You know what I mean? And even in some of the training, they were like, oh, you guys are shooting them too much when they hit the ground. You know, you, you really only need, why did you shoot this guy five times in the chest? And then in the head, like, you really only need one shot in the heart. And he should, two shots, and he should be dead. Or you can even People shoot a guy stupid. in the head, and he's still going to come. He can come back to. I had guys tell me stories that they were, um, one of my buddies, uh, it was an HBT, and he was looking at the picture of him, and he was like, got, and the dude was all swollen up, and he got like inches from his face. And he was going back and forth with this picture. And the dude had been laying there for like five minutes. And the dude comes right back too for a second. You know what I mean? Like kick started back up and I fell over and he died. out. But he kick started back up. You know what I mean? And um, these things happen. And so that's why, you know, people think it's excessive. But when, when you have to, and you don't have a support element to pick them up. So if you engage something, you're having to move to another target. You don't have time enough to manage that guy and then if you cuff at somebody that you think that may be alive but he could die and then you leave a dead person with cuffs on him you know what i mean They're, given the environment that you may be in that's going to be bad news anyway that's a, but that's a whole nother topic there but it's well, not even going to get down that road but needless yeah. to say there's a reason why freaking people uh put a lot of holes in people you know what i mean because right. you don't right. want them to kick start back up and you or your buddy get shot in the back of the head or the guy just rolls over halfway there and opens up a grenade and then flops yeah. back and then all of a sudden freaking uh, it's, it's game on and those things have happened, but people don't talk about it. People don't, don't write stuff down. People don't log it. If you're not there for the long haul, understand the, the, the crazy shit that happens. Like people are, are manipulated by what they see on TV and what they grew up with and what people say, but reality is not always like that and their perception you know, shapes their training, their perception shapes what they think they're going to do, but it often is not reality, you know? Yeah. This is the end of part one of Retention Shooting with Greg Thompson. Stay tuned for part two in the next podcast.